Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I had a chance to visit with the guys from the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project, a bunch of space archaeologists who, from their really interesting office, have been restoring classic images of the moon acquired from satellites or spacecraft from the 1960s. So this is a little video of my visit there. And so yeah, this is, uh, where are we? Well, this is Sky Park? Or yeah, it? well, this this is McMoon's. McMoon's, because you're based in an old McDonald's restaurant on yeah. the we're, NASA Ames or Moffett Field. Research, we're in the research park at uh, NASA Ames. Uh, in 2008, we were looking to get started on this project, and there were two buildings available, a, <laughs> uh, a barber shop and this McDonald's, which had just closed down. And somebody hit the barber shop with a car, so uh, <laughs> we were <laughs> we defaulted to the McDonald's. Well, uh, I mean, it has a very nice kitchen. You've actually got everything here, but you're not cooking burgers and French fries. What are you guys cooking in here? We have the uh, we have a set of two-inch magnetic tapes from the lunar orbiter missions. Mm -hmm. uh, these were a series of five missions that flew in 1966 and 1967 to uh, do mapping of the moon in preparation for the Apollo landings to make sure that there weren't going to be hitting any craters or anything. Exactly. Right? They had to... Uh, or landing in a boulder field. Yes. They, they, needed to, uh, they needed to find landing sites that had surface roughness that was uh, good enough that the lunar module would not uh, have a problem landing in these areas. And so uh, all of the uh, resolution requirements for this mission was derived from the physical parameters of the lunar module. Uh, so they needed resolution of about a meter. Okay. So uh, can we, can we uh, let's, these are some of the images up here, I guess? Yeah. yeah. So, but these are, now this is a restored image? This is a restored image. This was the first image that we uh, we brought off the tape. This is really, actually, I mean, you can just find this on the internet. And it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a wow image. Uh, this was from Lunar Orbiter 1. And, uh, we got lucky that this image was on a tape that already had the demodulation applied to it, which made things really easy for us down the road uh, because this was kind of our, our Rosetta Stone. Uh, we had to build a demodulator. There was very little specification on the demodulator. No. No, the, the demodulator, we just got to explain, that's taking the signal and it's converting the signal on these tapes. Which the signal on these tapes is the, the raw radio signal as it was transmitted back to the Earth. It's not image data. You have to apply a, a process to that data to turn it into essentially TV data, and you take these strips of TV data and you assemble them into into uh, this final image and then you process it to make sure that everything joins together nicely because I guess this is a what is a, it? A, a image from the uh, original tape record uh, you can see this this vertical banding yep and uh, this was there was film aboard the spacecraft it was essentially a, a flying oh, so photographic studio they would take the exposure develop the film on board the spacecraft and then scan the the film in strips with an electron beam, and the uh, there's a detector on the other side of the film that would modulate the radio signal, and they would do the inverse of that process back on the Earth. They would actually send that signal to a uh, a kinescope, basically a CRT, mm -hmm. and they would uh, they would put film in front of the CRT and slowly scan it across film, it. and they the film would be, become exposed. They developed that. They laid these strips out on a light table, mm -hmm. took a photograph of that. Then they would take those, lay them out on like the floor of an airplane hangar, <laughs> and get up on a, a crane and take a picture of that. And that's that's 1960 <laughs> Google Moon. That's 19. And now, of course, we have Photoshop, and yeah. uh, we actually have technology for doing this. But so, can you show us the actual tape machines that are? Yeah. I, do you have these around? Or yeah. I see tape machines everywhere, but so uh, so these. Ooh, look at these. This is what you see in those 1960s sci-fi movies where they're hacking the computer, right? Exactly. These things spin back and forth furiously. So it's an Ampex um, FR, S901. Yeah, th these are FR900s. Okay. Uh, video recorders. These particular recorders were used by the Air Force as radar data recorders. Mm -hmm. We happened to uh, uh, get them through a circuitous 
uh, set of events, they were first given to JPL in the 90s to perform this project. Mm -hmm. uh, it was put on hold. JPL kept the tapes in storage, but the, the tape players themselves were actually taken home by one of the researchers because she didn't want to see them get scrapped. Quite rightly so. She took them home. She stored them in her garage for about 20 years. Uh, really more of a barn than a garage. <laughs> there were, uh, when we got these in here initially, there was about uh, you know, three-eighths inch of uh, hay dust on top dust. of them, you know, <laughs> accumulated. And uh, this is what the interiors look like as well. Yeah. You know, we get pro I mean, these are big chunks, big uh, the, cables. These were, these were very expensive machines back in the day. All the contacts are rhodium plated. This this cost more than a house in uh, the 1960s. Oh, wow. And of course, nowadays they're priceless because there's only a couple in the world that work now, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, these are the only ones that you we're aware of that uh, are still operational. And you had to restore the tape heads, I understand? Yeah, one of the big issues with this project was as the tape passes through here, this has to spin mm -hmm. at uh, several to thousand... To scan across the tape, right? Yeah, at several thousand RPM. So uh, these little head tips here, mm -hmm. they get eroded by the tape as they're continuously being... Uh, dragged through the, the oxide that's oh, on the yeah. tape that contains that magnetic data. And uh, these need to be refurbished after a certain amount of time, and it's about $6,000 to wow. refurbish. Um, and you had a company, I understood it was a company in Colorado or yeah, something there, that did that? There's one, one guy left in the world, basically, oh, wow. who, who still does... And yet, bizarrely, you're literally a few miles down the road from the Ampex HQ, but they're not in this business anymore. No, although I, I did go up there and uh, talk to some of the engineers because he found some uh, some of these head tips laying around in the office there, ah. and uh, they were willing to give us some of those. Oh, that's nice. So it was it, it was still fortunate to have them around, and, and the really the the best thing about being in this area is that. Even though they're uh, you know up in their 70s and 80s now, there's still a lot of engineers around who uh, worked on Ampex yeah. broadcast tape recorders uh, and, and really understand this. And, and you know, let's, these were also used for things like TV and things like that as well. These are similar to the, the similar TV, technology TV broadcast okay. uh, equipment. These these are earlier than uh, well. At I'm, least, at least the ones that I'm familiar. Just with. coming around this size and side and seeing these giant. <laughs> I guess these are capacitors and. Yeah, there's. there's wow. Some, uh, Epic power. Oh, this is awesome stuff here. <laughs> All of these capacitors are new. Uh, of course, They're capacitors huge. Don't still. last. Uh, no, but the don't last forty years. But, but the technology behind them hasn't really changed. Yeah, exactly. And then you've got all these. Oh, wow. Look at these things. This is gorgeous. All of these belts had to be replaced. All of the rubber on these pin rollers, things like that. It really had to be refurbished, like like you refurbish uh, an old car or something. So, so uh, yeah. So you, how, how many uh, images have you gone through yet? Have you? So we we basically captured uh, the entire data set worth of tapes right. at this point. Uh, that's about twelve hundred tapes. Uh, there are, there's a bit of duplication, so we didn't have to run every single tape that we have in our possession. And and now from those tapes, you've essentially got good quality images of what the moon looked like, you know, almost 50 years ago. Right. And we can compare it with modern maps and say, figure out what the rate of cratering is, which is a something I'm fascinated by. Yep. We can actually get a decent count on the number of small bodies hitting the moon in 50 year period. That's absolutely one of the, uh, uh, objectives of this, this project, and uh, while we haven't found any natural craters, uh, you can actually identify in a photograph that's near the Apollo 12 landing site, that's also where Surveyor 3 landed. Well, this photo was taken prior to Surveyor 3, and Surveyor 3 had a, a solid retro rocket descent stage. Yeah. And you can see the crater that that created when it impacted the surface. Well, what about any of the other Apollo spacecraft? Uh, the actual Apollo spacecraft. You, you can mean. see uh, you can see the before and afters of those landing sites. So you can verify that spacecraft actually landed at the sites claimed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, anyone who doubts that is probably not going to uh, accept that particular I, set of evidence, but it, it does exist. It's, or, yes, it, it's just important to get them before they start doubting. Oh, I yeah. Think. <laughs> so that they are armored against the, the insanity, let's say. <laughs> um, so what else have we got here that we want to look at? So uh, let, me, let me show you the tapes. Okay. So let's go and see the tapes. Once again, yeah, the recipe is up there. So you're serving up uh, images, or you're serving up lunar images on classic tapes. Do I want fries with that? So, I mean, this is because it was part of Moffat Field. It was like an army base, so they were self-sufficient. They had their own... Um... Yeah, the Navy left uh, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. This, this was uh, the Navy side of the base. Okay. And it was all turned over to uh, NASA. Right. And... Uh, in this part of the base, this is called the Research Park. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few um, small companies that are primarily working on uh, spaceflight projects, and uh, they, they lease space here and, and have interactions with uh, NASA on various projects uh, related to satellite development. Uh, one of the Google Lunar X Prize teams is, is based here in the Research Park. Oh, right, park. yeah. I wonder how that's turning out. <laughs> been following several other teams on that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, these, these are the uh, magnetic tapes. Look at those things. So how many images go on one of these tapes, right? Well, there's different types of images. There's, okay. there's high resolution images, mm -hmm. which are about three times the size, physical size, of a medium resolution image. Okay. And so one of these tapes, if it's run end to end, it's about an hour to to read it, okay. Tape. That contains one high res, one medium, and maybe part of another medium. Okay, so you're getting basically one image from these. And the resolution of these images, roughly in modern terms? One meter. Okay, uh, but in terms of frame, pixel, how many pixels? Uh, they are very big. It's mm -hmm. about 16,000 by on a, on a high res. Mm -hmm. uh, it is over 40,000. Wide. Okay, so we're still way above, you know, 4K, 8K, 16K oh, yeah. cinema standards, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, you're still having to fill one of these for just one image. Right. And, uh, and you can see some side-by-sides here. Right. On, on, the, uh, on the right here you have our recovered image, and on the left you have uh, a lunar reconnaissance orbiter image. We've, we've done these mm -hmm. overlays between the two. And uh, the resolutions in most cases are quite comparable. That's great. Yeah. Now, in the lunar orbiter, the missions were flown in different orbits. Hmm. Uh, so the best resolutions are from lunar orbiters two and three, and that's at the near side of equatorial re region, uh, where they were interested in landing these Apollo spacecraft. Mm -hmm. You have about a one meter resolution. Right. Uh, and because we're several generations better than the uh, analog data record, the film, mm -hmm. because they were having to take a photograph of a photograph of a photograph. Right. That was the only way that they had to Right, you've gone uh, back to the source. So that's the beauty of this, right? Right, right. We've gone back to the, the best data that you can get. Um, you know, these spacecraft were intentionally crashed into the... Unfortunately, because you know, it would be nice to go up there and pull the film. And <laughs> yeah, well, the, the film has... Uh, Probably not survived. Those are some very high energy impacts. Yes, they tend to be. There, there's very. I don't think there's many impacts of space that aren't high energy. Just <laughs> that is true. But uh, yeah. But this is this is marvelous. So uh, you've done all this, and the images are going. Are they available yet? Or uh, you can go to moonviews.com, mm -hmm. and moonviews.com has uh, some reduced resolution versions of these images. Mm -hmm. We have a NASA supported server that is currently undergoing a redesign and I don't know when that will be available again but it should be very soon. And is, is the plan to make all the images available? At... Yeah, we're going to be submitting all of the data including the original uh, captured mm -hmm. raw data. Uh, that will all be submitted to the planetary data system. So uh, it's going to be freely available, uh, everything from, from the raw data up to our assembled images. And I suspect that you know, uh, other people will do a better job than I of uh, assembling these things with 
even better and more modern techniques than we had specced in 2008 when we started this project. Technology has moved on quite a bit since even then. But yes, 50-year-old images recovered and looking awesome. And Okay. Well, there you have it. Those are the guys at the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project. They are also involved in a fascinating race against time to recover the ISEE-3 spacecraft, which is going to fly by Earth in August, and it's possible to recapture it into a stable orbit. The only thing is, everyone has forgotten the technology on how to talk to it, but these guys, being space archaeologists, are the ones trying to make it happen. They have a rocket hub uh, page trying to get the money for it and I totally suggest you guys go and check it out. Anyway, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.